So let's dive into our first session. Um, and I'm very pleased to hand this over um, to Kara Kroger, um, who is an ag specialist in our San Antonio office. And uh, Kara, we'll get this thing started. Thanks so much, Kara. Uh, good morning, and thank you for joining us for the first Soil Health Innovation Conference. We're very excited to have everybody here. And I wanted to start with just a little housekeeping. Steve covered some of it, but we are recording this session. And during this session, if you have any questions, please uh, type them into the Zoom chat window. Uh, the WOVA Q&A will be answered after the session, not during the session. So use that Zoom chat for a response uh, from Fred during this session. And then be sure to access that QR code that will come up at the last three minutes of the session. And you can take a picture of that to get those credits. So uh, I'm very excited to present our first session of the day with Fred Provenza. Speaking personally, after having shifted from a 17 year career in nutrition to one in regenerative agriculture, I was thrilled when I came across Fred's research and books. Uh, his book, Nourishment, What Animals Can Teach Us About Rediscovering Our Nutritional Wisdom, sheds so much light on how deeply integrated and reliant we are on functioning ecosystems for human, animal, and planetary health. Over the past few years, I've had the opportunity to get to know Fred and pick his brain about his life's work studying behavioral ecology at the uh, Utah State University and how learning influences foraging behavior and how behavior links soil, plants, herbivores, and humans. So upon doing so, I have come to discover that there are very few people currently living on this planet with the knowledge that, Fred's ho that Fred holds. Fred's academic repertoire is rich, but what is even more impressive to me about Fred is that he has spent a great deal of time observing nature and has come to understand how important the subtle nuances of ecosystems are in relationship to the bigger picture. His knowledge is well-rounded in science and innate intuition. He is truly a cutting edge practitioner in his field and an inspiring mentor to many. Even though he is doing his best to retire, <laughs> his tireless commitment to sharing his passion is apparent as you will discover today. I have placed, I'm going to place the titles of his three books into the Zoom chat for your reference. Uh, there are many accolades that I could share about Fred's career, all of which can be found online. But ultimately today, I want to acknowledge uh, that we are honored to have Fred here to share his deep and gentle wisdom with us. So without further ado, I turn it over to you, Fred. Thank you very much, Kara, for that wonderful, uh, kind introduction. And thanks to NCATS, Steve Clayton, all the, all the folks. I very much, uh, it's an honor to be here with you for, for certain. Um, so today, I want to begin by pointing out that pallets link soil and plants with livestock and humans through three interrelated processes that Kara was, was alluding to. Um, first, Liking for food is mediated by feedback, and that feedback is coming from cells and organ systems, including the microbiome, in response to nutritional and medicinal needs, which are met by nutrients, energy, protein, minerals, and vitamins, and the thousands of other compounds that plants produce, these so-called secondary compounds that we'll talk a bit more about as we go along today. Um, second, Mother is a transgenerational link to foodscapes and landscapes. Her knowledge of what and what not to eat, where and where not to go to forage is essential for helping her offspring to get a start in life. Her influence begins in the womb through flavors in her amniotic fluid, continues at birth through flavors in her milk, and she serves as a model for what and what, what not to eat and where and where not to forage as her offspring begin to forage. Third, animals must have access to a variety of wholesome foods. Um, the more they are restricted, for instance, to a feedlot ration or a monoculture for livestock or to ultra processed foods for we humans, the less any of us can meet needs for nutrients and self-medicate both therapeutically and prophylactically. In that sense then, I often think that plants turn dirt into soil and diverse mixtures of plants turn soil into homes, grocery stores, and pharmacies for herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores below and above ground. Um, 50 years ago now, 
I was working on a ranch in central Colorado in Salida area. And I was also going to school at Colorado State University studying wildlife biology and ecology. And um, over and over again, whether it was on the ranch or in the classes at, at CSU, especially they were talking about the importance of plant diversity for habitat to create habitat uh, for, for wild species. And as I've gone through the 50 years since then, I got the words at the time I understood, but I've come to appreciate at such a deep level that nothing is more important for health through nutrition than landscapes that have a great diversity of different plant species. Um, 40 years ago, when I was a graduate student at Utah State University, myself and many other people in wildlife and range were doing uh, food selection studies, looking at the botanical and chemical composition of the diets of wild and domestic animals under a variety of different situations. And what we would find is that while well, three to five to seven plants would make up the bulk of the diet for animals uh, in any one meal, they'd eat another 50 to 75 plants as they went from meal to meal throughout the day. And back in the day, we focused on the three to five and we discounted the 50 to 75. But as I've gone on in my career, I've come to appreciate that that 50 to 75 is providing a diverse array of these phytochemicals that cells and organ systems need to maintain their health and that are best eaten in small doses. And so what would appear to be not so important historically, all this tremendous diversity, I've come to appreciate that it's very, very important. Um, we know from many studies of domestic and wild animals that when animals are eating phytochemically rich diets, the diversity of species in their gut increases. It's the same thing for human beings, of course, as well. But we're also learning that the gut of the soil is the same thing and that plants each harbor their own unique microbiome. And I wanna make a point of this. We know that each of us is so unique, we can be uh, identified by our fingerprints, bloodhound can track us by our odors. That same thing is true for every individual, be it a plant or an animal on this planet. So they all, uh, the microbiomes become absolutely unique to the individuals. Um, there's some really interesting work coming out of various places, but this that I'm going to talk about here briefly is coming out of Utah State University. And what they're showing for sheep and cattle is that health improves when they eat mixtures of plants and some of the tannin containing plants like bird's foot, trefoil and sandfoin become very important parts of the mix uh, in terms of enhancing nutrition. They're showing that these animals also gain weight more efficiently with these mixes with less emissions of greenhouse gases and they can reach slaughter weight nearly as quickly as animals in feedlot. It's very exciting kind of research when you think about the implications uh, for the health of, of the livestock, the, the plant diversity, and then the health of human beings, which I'm going to talk more about as I go along here. Uh, during the years that we were working, we were finding too that biodiver biochemically diverse diets enabled animals to eat foods in sequences that complement one another. So take a plant like endophyte infected tall fescue, which um, is really by all rights a toxic plant. When, when it's planted in combination with different plant species though, and when they're tan tannin containing plants like trefoil or sandfoam, an appetizer of trefoil helps cattle and sheep to eat far more fescue than they can eat if they just have fescue alone. We did similar kind of work and others have as well on rangeland plants and bitterbrush and sagebrush are, are an example of that. An appetizer of bitterbrush helps the sagebrush to go down. So the diversity and the way animals learn to use diversity and how that becomes a part of the culture of the herds of animals becomes a very important part of, of ecosystem function. Uh, to me, I'm not surprised that livestock producers are finding that morbidity and mortality decreases when stock or cattle are allowed to forage on diverse mixtures of plants rather than on monocultures. Now that's the same thing that Glenn Elzinga is finding in Alder Springs Ranch near Salmon, Idaho. And what he's doing is using shepherding practices, much like French shepherds do, 
to build soil health, to increase organic matter in soils. He's doing that by the way that he moves animals across the landscape to enhance plant diversity. Um, he tells me that he doesn't supplement anymore with minerals. He doesn't need to because the animals are getting that from the landscapes and the way he's moving them across those landscapes. And he's also says he, he rarely, if ever, has to treat an animal for, for sickness. That scales in then. The meat that he sells has some important um, qualities relative to human health. And I want to talk about that as I go along here. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. In the meantime, though, I want to point out, um, start going back to where I started on this idea of, of pallets linking animals to landscapes, that nobody has to tell a bacteria, a wild insect, fish, bird, or mammal how to eat or how to replicate. They know how to do that. Um, domestic animals that are locally adapted to their environments do a great job of selecting foods from some pretty good challenges. You know, when you look across a landscape, we know that some of the plant species and parts out there are nutritious, but others are quite toxic. And we know it gets more complicated than that. Individual plants can be nutritious or toxic depending on the time of day, week, and season and on the resources available in the environment where the plant's growing, the amount of sunlight, nutrients, and water greatly influences the chemical characteristics of the same plant species growing in different environments. So there are a lot of challenges that herbivores face. They do very well meeting those challenges. Now I'm saying these things to set up this point here. Consider the irony. Um, we people have to be told constantly by authority figures what and what not to eat and the advice for any of us who've been alive very long, we realize that advice is changing, changing, changing all the time. So it raises the question for human beings, have we lost the ability to identify and select nourishing diets or has that ability been hijacked? And I'm going to argue that it's been hijacked and link it back to these ideas on plant diversity and soil and, uh, and so forth. This book here, The Dorito Effect by Mark Shaxter, is I think a great book that talks about how the wisdom of the body has been hijacked. And as he points out, a couple of things have happened during the last 70 years. First of all, the flavors of foods have become blander and that includes everything from meats to produce. But at the same time, the food industry has learned how to make processed foods, ultra processed foods become absolutely irresistible. So what's happened over that time period if you're old enough, you can think back to that, is that we've really disincentivized real foods because they don't taste so good anymore. It's no wonder kids don't like their vegetables. There's no flavor. And we've made junk food all the more desirable. Um, and that's documented in really nice review papers that have been written by different groups around the world, actually, that point out in the last 70 years, uh, the phytochemical richness of foods has declined from 10 to 50% uh, across the board. And that, there's three reasons for that. Uh, one is the varieties that we selected for, more about that in a minute. Also the conditions under which we grow them, we irrigate and fertilize. Um, that combination has accented growth at the expense of phytochemical richness of, of the health promoting qualities of food. Uh, we also pick green and we ripen and transit and all of those lead to produce that can look great, but it has absolutely little or no flavor, which means little or no um, value to, to the cells and organ systems in our body. Um, so I wanna step back then and talk about how that's come about in a bit more detail. And you know, there's 50 years of research by ecologists talking about how resource availability, that is abiotic and biotic factors in the environment, influence the formation of soils and how that in turn influences which plant species uh, grow on sites and the chemistry of those species. Um, I'm going to, to be emphasizing as I go along in this, these so-called primary and secondary compounds. And I wanna make a point here right off the bat about secondary compounds. They come under these broad classes, phenolics, terpenes, alkaloids, the details don't matter. There's some examples on the screen. What's important is to realize that the species, all of the wild species have these in spades and that they're fundamental to the health of plants. Uh, during the past 50 years, 
ecologists have learned of many, many roles. So rather than secondary compounds nowadays, we realize that they're every bit as important as the so-called primary compounds. And they serve roles as diverse as these on the screen from sunscreen and antioxidants to allelopathy, how plants can, have, can diminish competition from other plant species growing around them to drought resistance, to persistence. And they also play very important roles in defending plants against being grazed too much. They help plants to regrow following grazing or, or injury. So the point I'm trying to make is that there are many, many, many roles that we've come to, to discover that these compounds are playing. Now, here's the irony. And when I say this, I'm not being judgmental in any sense of the word. I'm, I'm reflecting here on what's happened and, and it makes sense how it happened. But what's happened is, as ecologists are learning of all the values that none of us knew about, others have been reducing their concentration in the pasture plants and in the crops that we grow and in the produce that we grow uh, to increase yields, also to maximize uh, content of energy and protein, but uh, that's diminished total phytochemical richness as we were talking about. And that's also made plants more susceptible to environmental hardships. And that's something I really want to key on here, thinking about trade-offs that, that have taken place. So as we selected against these compounds for growth and, and so forth, we've come to rely on fossil fuel-based uh, pesticides to control insects. Those compounds used to do that herbicides to control weeds. I was talking about allelopathy. Plants have the ability, used to have the ability to do that. Fertilizers to enhance the growth of plant. I think some of the research that's being done, done nowadays, and when you think about where agriculture is, and we've selected the most, uh, new, the, the best soils to grow uh, crops on, and the research is pointing out that most agricultural soils, in fact, aren't deficient in nutrients. Rather, it's farming practices, tillage, fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides that have adversely affected the soil, and in particular, the gut, the microbiome in, in the soil, in ways that inhibit nutrient uptake. Uh, very exciting and interesting work that's being done by soil scientists in that regard. Uh, more learning from ecologists and soil scientists nowadays that each plant species harbors a unique rhizosphere community. Um, and that when you get diverse mixtures of plant species, they interact with one another in ways that enhance the total soil microbiome. They enhance nutrient availability and they alter the chemistry of plants. Amazingly interesting and relevant and important research relative to the health of creatures below and above ground. Beyond that, uh, I think this amazing work that's showing that nutrient inputs from living roots are two to 13 times more efficient than litter inputs at forming both slow cycling mineral associated soil organic carbon and fast cycling particulate organic carbon. Well, how does that happen? It's no different from what's happening in the rumen of a cow or a sheep or a goat. Nutrients and the right proportions uh, stimulate growth of microbial populations. And anybody who studies ruminant nutrition knows that how important that is. Well, it's the same thing for the soil microbiome. Like in ruminant nutrition, the dead bodies of microbes make up 80% of the, of the nitrogen supply for ruminant animals. Well, dead microbes can make up over 50% of all soil organic carbon that adhering to mineral surfaces and forming soil aggregates. So tremendously interesting and important kind of, of research that's showing the importance of plant diversity, living roots and so forth in the health of, of systems below and above ground. And so Steve, as you pointed out right up front, then these different practices can either in, uh, enhance that or inhibit what's going on in the gut, gut microbiome. We know now that minimizing soil disturbance, maximizing crop diversity, maintaining soil cover, integrating livestock and their impacts, um, grazing, urine and feces, and grazing in ways, Clayton, as we would know from our lifetime of frequency, intensity, time of grazing, grazing in ways that maximize root, maximize root biomass uh, and maintain living roots are all, are all integral then to the health of, of ecological systems in that sense. 
So beyond that, though, we've also come to rely, so as we selected against these secondary compounds in, in plant, pasture, pasture plants and in, in uh, crops and so forth, we've also come to rely on antibiotics and anhelimetics to treat diseases and parasites in animals. You know, it's amazing research that's been done over the last decade or so, couple of decades, to show that insect, uh, creatures from insects to, to primates can self-medicate. When they're provided with a diverse array of different plant species, they learn to do that. This woolly bear caterpillar here that's on your screen, it's so interesting. Um, it'll switch if it gets parasitized, it'll switch from eating plant, <clears throat> plants like lupin to uh, plants like poison hemlock because the alkaloids in pet poison hemlock uh, get rid of the internal parasites and the caterpillar actually develops a liking as they shown through neural studies, a liking for that when for the, the hemlock when it's been parasitized. So amazing kind of work showing the knowledge of creatures if they're given alternatives to be able to, to meet their needs. Same thing for livestock. We showed throughout my career that livestock can learn to self-medicate. They learn which, which compounds to take when they're in which states, and that includes internal parasites. I think it's very interesting to realize too that when we treat animals with Ivomec to get rid of internal parasites, they'll switch their selection preferences. Whereas if they had parasites, they'll select foods that, that'll cause those parasites to become diminished. Uh, when, when they're given a dose of Ivomec, they no longer use certain tannin containing medicinal shrubs. Finally, we've isolated and purified these compounds to amplify their effects but that simply made resistance all of them easier. We now have antibiotic resistance, uh, we have pesticide resistant insects, and we have herbicide resistant plants. So I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that trying to understand ecological systems and processes and the values of these secondary compounds for so many functions is so worthwhile for us to have a think about nowadays. And there are some plant breeding programs that are really starting to have a think about that. Um, people are now trying to genetically engineer back into crop plants resistance that they originally had. Uh, I participated in a conference a few years back titled Far <coughs> Farm, Farm Ecology, and it was about pharmacological aspects of ecology. And one of the most interesting talks I heard was by a lady who has worked, spent her life working in the pharmaceutical industry. She was pointing out how when she was early in her career and going to school, plants were the model for, 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 um, for health in, and for, for uh, pharmaceutical kinds of products and how the industry had moved away from that. And she was making a plea that we need to get back to understanding plants, plants chem, plant secondary chemistry, and the value of that in nutrition and health of a broad array of creatures, including human beings. So what we've done then, if you think about it too, more broadly, is we've moved from a sunlight driven economy to a fossil fuel driven economy <clears throat> and everything that I've been saying. And so to produce a calorie of food requires two calories of fossil fuel for machinery to plant, irrigate, harvest crops, fertilizers, herbicides, insecticides, antibiotics, analometics, and so forth. We use another eight to 12 calories to produce, package, deliver, store, and cook modern food. You know, if you think about it, no wild species could even start to survive expending 10 to 14 calories to gain one calorie of food energy. So we've really painted ourselves into a box, and that box is based upon very inexpensive fossil fuels. A um, month ago, I read a paper by this, by this fellow here, Higgins, Economics for the Future Beyond the Superorganism. And uh, it took me back to the decade of the 2000s when we were talking so much about peak oil and just brought that right back in, into our face. It's an amazingly, amazingly profound, interesting, important paper. Uh, among the many things he talks about, he says, you know, economics is based upon land, labor, and capital but it pays virtually no attention to the fact that all that's been built in this last century has been based upon very, very inexpensive uh, fossil fuels. And the energy return on investment from back in the 1930s through to today has plummeted. Um, and 
as he points out in the paper, fracking is simply kick the can down the road and not very far. So we're utterly dependent on fossil fuels. Uh, the, our ability to get them and utilize them is greatly diminishing. And we're going to be in a fix if we don't start thinking in very serious ways about that. And his paper is a super read about all of that. So this seeming catastrophe, though, I think is creating opportunities to produce foods locally, as, as many of you folks are doing in ways that nurture relationships among soil, water, plants, herbivores, farmers, ranchers, and consumers. The beauty I see is agriculture can once again be at the heart of communities, but from soil and plants to livestock and humans, I think we're gonna all need to, to think about how did the processes of nature work? How do they work? And how can we start to work with nature and, and co-evolve with nature and the communities? Um, building on that, I wanna pick up on this idea of plant diversity and talk about then, okay, producing food locally for, for local peoples and what that can mean for the biochemical richness of the diet and then the quality of foods that, that we, we end up eating. Um, there was a study done in Italy a couple of years ago where they fed animals, dairy cattle, either a total mixed ration or they had them out on these very diverse different pasture species. And what they found was that when they looked at the phytochemical and biochemical richness of the milk and cheese, it was much greater, which translates into health benefits for us that I'm going to get into here in a minute, when the animals were foraging on diverse array of species. They also found that the Italian people strongly, strongly preferred the flavor of milk and cheese um, that were coming from the pasture as opposed to, to the total mixed ration. Their palates, going back to flavor feedback, were telling them of the enhanced benefits of, of the, the milk and cheese coming from pasture. The same thing is true for meat. And I want to start by uh, referring to this diary of Warren Angus Ferris, Life in the Rocky Mountains. And he's talking about food and about eating food, and particular bison. And he says that, you know, bison in poor flesh were horrible, basically. But as we grew strong and hearty, and now they, as the bison grew, grew healthy in the spring and summer of the year, points out, we grew strong and hardy and now not one of us, but is ready to insist that no other kind of meat can compare with that of a female bison in good condition. He goes on to point out that with it, they required no seasoning. They could boil, roast, or fly it, fry it however they wanted to. And they lived upon it solely. If you think about that, no other thing in the diet living strictly on meat without bread or vegetables of any kind. And as he points out, they never got tired of eating it meal after meal, which would be, wouldn't happen with any other kind of food. So we've become very interested in, in those kind of observations and the implications of those. Any of you who are hunters know that the flavor of meat is influenced by the diets the animals are, are eating. Yet when you get into the scientific literature, we know very little about how phytochemical richness of the diet affects meat flavor, the quality of meat, the ability of meat to cause us to satiate, to, to be satisfied, as Warren Angus Ferris was talking about, and our human health as well. There's just very little known. Certainly, we, we talk about omega-3, omega-6 ratios, and they're important, and CLAs, and they're important, but we're missing a much broader story. So there's, I'm a cheerleader helping to write papers and grant proposals for two people. One is uh, Stefan von Vliet at Duke University, who's a human nutritionist there, and Scott Kronbarg, who's at USDA ARS in Mandan. And what we're doing is really comparing uh, fake meats with meat from feedlots, with meat from animals eating phytochemically rich diets. We want to look at, first off, we're using this metabolomic analysis. That's a big word that simply it's a technique that allows you to look at the phytochemical and biochemical richness of meat and dairy products to get a really broad overview of that. We're also doing feeding trials to look at inflammation, more about that in a second, and then clinical trials to look at satiety, inflammation, and health from meat coming from different sources as part of a diet. Um, we've have one paper that will be published soon, 
where going back to Glenn Elzinga, we were looking at beef that he's producing from those incredibly phytochemically diverse landscapes and comparing that with soy-based and pea-based alternatives doing metabolomic analyses. And the point I'd wanna make is, well, when you look at the nutrition labels, they would look fairly similar between among those three products. But when you look at the metabolomics analyses, they're actually quite, quite different. Glenn's meat is so much richer phytochemically and biochemically. And we think that that has really important implications for human health. I'm gonna set the stage for, for that by saying, first off, that anytime we eat a meal, there's an inflammatory response in our body. The degree to which that occurs and how long that lasts depends upon what we're eating. When we're eating wholesome foods, um, that response can be low and not prolonged. When we're eating ultra processed diets, we can really get into trouble uh, over that. So that leads me to the, the trials that and the clinical trials that we're going to be doing with people. And they're based upon a study. There's only one bit done in the world uh, that was done in Australia a couple of, <clears throat> about 10 years ago. And what they were doing was looking at cattle finished on total mixed rations in a feedlot and comparing inflammatory response in human beings to that from meat, the, uh, from kangaroos foraging on really diverse landscapes in, in, uh, in Australia. And you might say, well, why would you do that comparison? If you've ever lived in Australia, you know that you can buy kangaroo in the grocery stores. And what they found was that when people ate meat from kangaroos on these diverse uh, phytochemically rich landscapes, there was basically no increase in inflammatory markers. On the other hand, when the meat was coming from feedlot, there was a rapid rise and a prolonged persistence in that. Now we've written several review papers related to, to that topic that I'm happy to share. And we're, we're going full speed into, into feeding trials and clinical trials with human beings to explore this, this topic. Um, more generally, the global shift away from eating phytochemically and biochemically wholesome foods to ultra-processed diets has encouraged 2.1 billion people to eat processed foods and become overweight or obese. That was illustrated really nicely in a study that came out just a couple of years ago, and they, they matched these. They were feeding ultra-processed diets or unprocessed diets, and they tried to match them as best they could for calories, sugar, fat, fiber, so forth. But what they found was that when people were eating the ultra processed diet, they ate 500 calories more every day of ultra processed compared to unprocessed. What that did for any of you who ever follow your weight on the scale and, and look at how what you're eating influences that, it's no surprise that they started to gain, that they gained weight over, over that two week period. And when they switched the diets, then when people that were on the ultra processed went to the, to the unprocessed, they ate less food and they, and they lost weight. A key point among many others is that processed foods do little to induce satiation, that is what causes a meal to, to end, or satiety, the, the, the length between meals. So when you're on a, eating ultra processed foods, we overeat and we gain weight. And that has, has really created a pandemic of obesity and diet-related diseases. Unfortunately, uh, any of you have gotten into this much, I was just reading a chapter from an upcoming book that's titled Follow the Money. And uh, you, you just, you realize that there's this terrible kind of uh, relationships that develop amongst the food industry, the medical industry, the pharmacy industry, and, and some people at, at universities that are really, you know, it's focused on symptoms, it's focused on, on uh, not on getting at fundamental causes and, and what, what stimulates health. Well, you don't, make, you don't make much money off of healthy food, which is really where that chapter was going, follow the money. And as a result, here in the U.S., 75% of us are overweight or obese, 50% pre-diabetic or diabetic, 88% metabolically unhealthy, 80% can't serve in the military. So again, it's reflecting as much as anything, but trying to raise awareness that this is where we are. And so how do we, how do we move away from that? that? That More on that in just a minute. Uh, the last thing I wanna mention in this regard is a study that was published in Nature in 2014. There's many, many studies, of course, that are being done on diet and climate. 
But I think this one really struck a, 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 a nice central kind of position. And they were projecting forward to 2050 in terms of population and the increase in greenhouse gas emissions. They were pointing out there's going to be a huge increase if we continue on this path toward ultra processed foods as part of the diet. You know, it started a lot here in the US, but it spread around the world. The key point they were making, and it's a data rich paper, is that there will be no net increase in food production emissions of greenhouse gases if diets worldwide became any combination of wholesome foods so that you know we could eat a wide variety of different foods um, and, and have no increase. They were really pointing out the, the adverse effects of the processed food. So I would say then, you know, as you look back at what's happened in human nutrition, we've extracted compounds from foods to enrich and fortify ultra processed foods. We've extracted foods from diets and diets from cultures. And we no longer know what it means to be locally adapted to the landscapes that, that we inhabit. Um, I often think compared to indigenous peoples and to wildlife species or domestic species that are locally adapted to, the, to their environments, what price do we pay when we ignore these transgenerational linkages to social and biophysical environment? And it's on that theme that I, I wanna end. And I'll begin by pointing out that in a broad array of taxa, everything from earthworms to insects, to fishes, to birds, to mammals, to human beings, that natal experiences affect food and habitat preferences. Um, and I'm looking at that little mountain bluebird that's there on your screen. Um, when I retired 12 years ago, my wife and I moved to the backwoods of Colorado. We were 12 miles in on graveled road from the nearest, nearest highway. And uh, we were living out there with nature, not no one around us. It suited us just fine, actually. But in this time of the year, about now, these mountain bluebirds would arrive. They, they'd come back from their neotropical haunts. And, uh, and they'd spend the, the spring and summer and early fall, and then they, they'd go back. And when I was visiting with ornithologists, they said, you know, when you put a band on those birds, what you come to realize is they come back to the same place and their offspring come back to the same place as well. Um, and so you think about that and you think, well, why would they do that? Well, it's the home field advantage. We talk about it in sports, but that's the home field advantage in life knowing what and what not to eat, where and where not to go, what's a predator, if a, if a neighboring bird makes a call, what's that call mean? And it might surprise you to realize that that earthworm there does the same sort of things. They develop the same sort of preferences. So it's very important. And it's no wonder then when we started 40 years ago to study um, the influence of mother in food and habitat selection, it wasn't hard to show profound kind of influences very, very easily in goats and sheep and cattle. As I mentioned at the beginning, these, these, uh, these, uh, it begins in utero as flavors in, in mom's diets gets into her amniotic fluid. The fetal phase system is fully functional during the last trimester of gestation. So this young fetus is already beginning to learn about what's food in the environment to become familiar with, with flavors. After birth, uh, flavors in mother's milk are cues to the diet that mother's eating. And then mother becomes a model um, for what and what not to eat as young animals begin to explore the environment. So much more I could say on that, but that, that's, that's the key points of the deal. And I'll get, just use, I could give many, many studies, but one study that really powerfully illustrates this and the importance, we were doing a lot of work with ranchers back in the days looking at, um, you know, where are the costs of oper ranch operation and it's all tied up in feeding animals during the winter, irrigating, cutting, baling, hauling hay, all the machinery that's required for that in the spring and summer and then feeding in the winter. So we were looking at ways to decrease the cost of ranch operation by what, what we fed, whether it was poor quality kind of straw or wintering animals out on, on mature kind of forages. But the studies we were doing were really highlighting local adaptation and what that means to make animals that are really able to, to do a great job of that. And one of the studies, two of the studies, we had mature cows who were exposed to straw either in utero, which was one set of studies, or fed straw for a couple months with their mothers as calves. 
And then we, these animals didn't see straw again for five years. And then we ran a three year study where straw made up the bulk of the diet from December through May. And what we were able to show was that either those in utero experiences or the experiences with mothers made those, cow, those mature cows later in life, they were better able to digest straw. They had higher body weight and condition throughout all three years of the study. They produced more milk. They had shorter postpartum intervals when, <clears throat> when fed straw as the bulk of the diet during pregnancies from, from five to five, eight years of age. So this is simply one example to illustrate the profound influence of experiences early in life on, on changing animals. Well, the very same thing, there's a rich literature in humans that shows the very same things. Mother's diet in utero, experiences early in life with milk and foods have the same kind of influence on our offspring. And what we're learning, and we were learning over the years, is that those experiences influence gene expression, this whole area of epigenetics. That's influencing form, that is to say the way different organ systems, including the microbiome develop, function, how physio physiological kinds of relationships. And then that influences foraging behavior, what animals are able to do. And the people have looked at everything from the central nervous system and how it develops to the gut, to kidneys, to all the organ systems of the body. And just a quick example here from some of our friends and colleagues in Australia, where salt brush is an important part of, of some communities out in Western Australia. And what they showed was that lambs exposed to salt brush in utero grow faster and handle salt loads better than lambs from mothers on pasture. They excrete salt more rapidly, drink less water, and maintain higher intake when, when eating salt brush. So there's the form, function, and behavior. Well, that same sort of thing's happening with e human beings, but nowadays, what's the sad state of affairs, given our uh, movement toward ultra-processed foods and, uh, and what's happened with that, diet-related dis diseases, obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and so on and so forth, is now what we're up against is this transgenerational metabolic syndrome characterized as follows, mothers who gain excessive weight during pregnancy, mothers who are obese, mothers who become diabetic during pregnancy are more likely to have fatter babies with higher incidence of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and can cancer. All of that relates um, to how organ systems develop and how they function. So how do we get out of this? How do we, how do we move away? And there are many things that people are thinking about one of the things that I, I reflect on often is this, though, and it has to do with the quote, you know, 75 years ago, Aldo Leopold, in a way, I don't think he foresaw all the particulars of what I'm talking about, but he, he was worried about what was coming down, down the pike in terms of, of where, where we were going with all of our technology. And he pointed out in a Sand County Almanac, he said, there are two spiritual dangers in not owning a farm. One is the danger of supposing that breakfast comes from the grocery, the other that heat comes from the furnace. To avoid the first danger, one should plant a garden, preferably where there's no grocer to confuse the issue. To avoid the second, he should lay a split of good oak on the andirons, preferably where there's no furnace, let it warm his shins while a February blizzard tosses the trees outside. In other words, what he's saying is let's get back as individuals to our linkages with, with landscapes that nurture us, basically. And, uh, you know, most people obviously don't own farms or ranches, but many, many of us have yards that can become our own little farms and ranches. We can get our hands back into the soil and relishing plant diversity. Um, this is where my wife Sue and I live in Innes, Montana now, and I've got a before and after shot. And I just want to make a couple of points related to that. We've, what we've tried to do, we've got a little bit of lawn around our place. We don't fertilize that lawn. We've allowed it to become infested with clovers that are fixing nitrogen. So that keeps the lawn green. Beyond that though, what we've really worked to do is to encourage the native plant species that grow in this area. And the rich mixes of plants from spring to summer to, to fall, 
that, that grow in this landscape. And it's beautiful to see them coming and going, uh, that diversity, and to see the amount of, of insect life uh, that comes to our place and the amount of wildlife species that come into the yard. We also are growing vegetable, herbal, and medicinal gardens, and we've added chickens to the place. Around the perimeter of the place, we've planted hundreds of native berry producing, um, berry producing shrubs that provide great kind of, of, of fruit for us as well as for wildlife species. So what I'm trying to say is that even though most of us don't own farms and ranchers, we can each be farmers and linking ourselves back with growing our own food. I think that's, as, as Leopold said, that, that's, that's so good for us uh, physically and spiritually in, uh, as a way to try to, to move away from what's happened with, with the whole accent on, on distancing ourselves from, from nature and, and, and how nature supports us uh, and the move toward the ultra processed foods. Beyond that though, when you think about the resources that we spend growing lawns annually, it's unbelievable. Over 30,000 tons of synthetic pesticides at a cost of well over $2 billion, not to mention all the herbicides and fertilize, fertilizers to weed and feed our lawns. Um, over 800 million gallons of gasoline. The gas spilled refilling lawnmowers is 17 million gallons, 1.5 times the amount spilled by the Exxon Valdez off the shores of Alaska years ago. Water out here in the arid west, residential water use outside the home is 30 to 60 percent of total water use. Depending on the estimate, 7 billion to 9 billion gallons of water are used each day for suburban irrigation. So I'll conclude by saying that over the years we've made an art form of dining, but we've tabled so many of these larger questions. Eating is participating in endless transformation as plants and animals are killed and eaten. Uh, and getting our hands back in touch with that, I think, is, is great for, for our humanity. As I eat, the energy and matter in someone, and uh, I'll make a point of this, plants and animals both are conscious and sentient, and it goes beyond the time frame I have to, to, to get into that, but they're, they're all sentient, conscious and sentient. This energy and matter in them becomes this entity I call, quote, me, which will, in the flicker of a cosmic eye, return to Earth as plants and animals when participating in a mystery. In pondering this mystery, we may come to realize that all life is sacred. It's not of whether you're killing animals or killing plants, all life is sacred. We're members of nature's communities. What we do to them, we do to ourselves. Only by nourishing them ultimately can we nourish ourselves. And I would say that we do that by declaring love, not war, on one another and the landscapes that we inhabit. Um, if you're interested in much more depth and breadth related to what I went very quickly through here today, there's a paper that was just published. It's just came out. It's titled, We Are the Earth and the Earth is Us, How Palettes Link Foodscapes, Landscapes, Heartscapes, and Thoughtscapes. And with that, I'll conclude and, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with all of you. It's, it's, it's indeed an honor and a privilege to do that. Thank you so much, Fred. That was wonderful. Can you hear me? Yes, Gary, I can. Okay, good. <laughs> I just want to make I'm sure. <laughs> I'm talked out by now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a few questions here. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just read those off for you. Um, a few, so maybe be brief <laughs> so we can get to as many as possible. Um, so one uh, listener, Julie, has asked, are there any insights into how the nutritional and phytochemical profile of staple grains like wheat, barley, and oats have changed over time? Yes, there are, you know, uh, yes, there, there are, and I'm just doing a, a six, six week series for people in Canada, and some of the ranchers there are really, really interested, farmers, I should say, farmers and ranchers are very interested in, in what's happened historically, and in monitoring different varieties, and in trying to work with people to select for var varieties related to this Topic. So I'm go, trying to go quickly. I can, I'm happy to take emails from people too later on and, and can provide more information, but that, that has been documented. 
And those reviews I mentioned that I'm happy to share with people uh, also document some of the changes that have taken place in both primary and secondary chemistry, the accent on, on yield as opposed to phytochemical richness and so forth. Awesome, thank you. Um, also, how would you change what's being taught at our land grant ag schools and ag business schools if you had power over the curriculum? Oh, that's a really, really good, that's a good question. I think, um, and you know, I, I'll say this, uh, having spent 40 years in the land grant schools and stuff, but I think, uh, I think there's so much opportunities to go in and really, and, and make changes that, that are so worthwhile and changes that are linked with what people in communities, in real life communities, or farmers and ranchers, uh, Clayton was making a point of that, of linking that in. We had a 10 year program the last decade that I was at Utah State University called Behave, where that's what we were doing was working with farmers, ranchers, and trying to work at university systems to uh, where I was anyway at Utah State to think about how do you, that's a big question because there's so much momentum that's going toward the big tech and the, you know, the moneyed interests and uh, yeah, I, I would love to get involved in a conversation on that actually. That would go, it's too many things are popping into my mind to make it a quick, <laughs> quick answer. But, you know, I think one way too for professors, if this kind of stuff resonates, you do it by changing the way you teach your courses. That's what I did at Utah State. I changed the way I taught the, the courses that I taught. It was very much about these kind of ideas, even in a college of natural resources. I, I do think we are seeing some shifts in that just, just happening naturally, and hopefully we'll see more. Uh, but this question kind of lends itself to the last one, but it's a little bit more practical. So what do you think are the primary barriers for more producers to shift towards these practices? Oh man, that's amazing too. Last week, I, sp I spent two hours on the phone with a group at in Colorado, and that's exactly what we were talking about, barriers to, to adaptation and innovation. And, uh, you know, we're making the point that a lot of people may, may look at at what people are doing and, and fully agree that these are really good ideas, but, but some of the challenges that we, we sure spent time talking about are just what, your, what do your neighbors think? You know, if you try to step outside the box, what's that, the social pressures, the kind of social pressures that can be put on people for, for trying to, to, to change what, what they're doing. The other thing we talked about, we talked about many factors, but we we're talking about for, for really, a uh, large scale shift to take place, probably it's going to be very important for consumers to get the to to really get get the message to get this kind of message. And we we're talking about the importance of, of all the different or different um, documentaries that are coming out. Biggest Little Farm, you and I talked about that or Kiss the Ground. Uh, Peter Bick is working on a massive documentary now. And they're all, when you talk to them, they're all focused on the consumer because, uh, you know, if you can get the consumer to wake up to what's happening and start to demand wholesome foods, um, farmers can produce that, farmers and ranchers can do, can do that, but the encouragement to try to do that, um, again, that's uh, such a good, good question. And like I say, we spent two hours, two very fruitful hours, just brainstorming, talking about their experience, NRCS people and, uh, you know, people that are working with, with ranchers. It was, uh, yeah, very, very good question. That's great. And also, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar, Fred, but also just to answer that question, uh, Patagonia just did a really large report on barriers to regenerative agriculture. And I can't remember the exact title of that publication, but if you typed in Patagonia barriers to regen ag, I think you could find it. It's a very long, long document uh, that really covers a lot of ground. Yes, that's very good. I, I actually um, got hooked up with Patagonia starting last spring and summer and have been really interacting with that group. And that's, again, a great group uh, in terms of their interests and what they're promoting. Absolutely the case. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, there was one other question here. I think we still have a few minutes. We have about two minutes left. Um, one of the questions was... Uh, I lost it um, about 
Okay, here we go. Are you encouraged by the expanding ecosystem service marketplace, carbon, water markets, et cetera? What in particular do you believe has integrity that you are familiar with? You know, that's something I'll, I'll be honest, Kara. I'm not so familiar with it as I should be. So I, I'm probably better off not to, to try to try to say much on, but Kara, but you may know far more than I do on that one. You know, if you want to, uh, well, we I, mean, have I know great, in a general sense, but. Yeah, we have some great podcasts on that. Uh, one of our, one of my colleagues here in the San Antonio office, Colin Mitchell has done quite a few podcasts and, um, webinars on that. So if you go to atra.incat.org, I would type in, you know, search Colin Mitchell and he, a lot of his presentations will come up on those different markets and they're, they're very, very good, uh, nice basis to understand what's going on in that arena. So, um, well, Fred, I think that's all the time that we have. And I'm really, really grateful for uh, your, your participation today. And I know everybody else is too. Um, I also, have gotten gotten a lot of requests for uh, resource links. And I know that you have a lot in your books that people can access and look in the back of the book for uh, resources and references. But I know that there's a lot of new publications, some of the things that you've sent me. And so I'll get with you and talk with you after that. But if anybody wants to uh, get some of those publication links for referencing this type of material, please email me at karak at ncat.org or you can, I think Fred, you mentioned that you're welcome to receiving emails. Uh, what is your email address, Fred? It's a long one, but let me give it to you. It's fred.provenza at emeriti, E-M-E-R-I-T-I dot U-S-U dot E-D-U. Okay, I think I've got that in the chat. Check it for me and make sure that's correct, Fred, if you know how to use the chat. Yep, that's perfect. That's perfect. And I'm happy to take emails. And as you say, Kara, to share, share information, uh, everything I'm talking, talked about here today, that there's some really nice publication, nice syntheses that are out there in addition to that one I showed at the last. So, you know, happy to share that with folks too. No, no question. And and I just want to say thanks again to you, Kara, and to um, the folks at NCAT uh, for the wonderful opportunity to be here with you this morning. Thank you, Fred. I hope that you have a good rest of your day and stay warm. Okay, same for you. Okay.